Welcome back to Beyond the Numbers with McKissick Appraisal. I'm your host, Julie Molendort, and today our guest is Dr. Randy Flowers. Dr. Randy Flowers is with RSDS, an appraisal firm that is making great strides around the United States. So welcome, Dr. Randy, and tell us a little bit about yourself, about your journey to your current position. Awesome. Thank you for having me today. Again, as Julie mentioned, my name is Dr. Randy Flowers. I serve as Vice President of Operations at RSDS. Uh, I've been with the company for two years, uh, and it's been quite the it's been quite the ride. Really, really love the company. Passionate about the company. I think you'll hear that throughout this interview today. But really, my journey starts all the way back uh, from where I'm from. I'm originally from a small town in the Midwest called Beeler, Kansas. Uh, I originally went to college actually to become a radiologist. And I realized that when I was in college, I didn't have the passion or the determination for the medical industry like I actually thought I did. Um, So what I did learn about myself through college though, is that I loved working with teams, leading people, creating change in organizations, and really seeing seeing myself as a servant leader. I like to invest my time and energy into people uh, and really empower them to grow collaboratively together. I feel when we can bring people together maximize their strengths off each other we can all do really amazing stuff so i actually found my niche initial niche uh in higher education uh i got my master's and my doctorate in education and i worked at a small private college called baker university started in student activities um, and went on to start leading different departments of the university Um, after 10 years i actually ended as a dean at a college are at Baker, uh, where I was overseeing 12 functions of the university. So through this, um, I, I, you know, I was leading things like recruitment for the university, uh, working on uh, different educational programs outside the classroom, building learning management systems that supported some of that extracurricular learning opportunities using instructional design technology. Um, and so I really loved my higher education experience because it really taught me a lot, not only about working with people, but really how to run a business. People don't think of education as a business, but the reality is, is higher education, it cannot function without students and it can't function without money. You still have to have enough money to pay the bills, even though it's a non-for-profit. And it really allowed me to think about how do you make this college stand out from the rest of the colleges? That's great. But what got me into the appraisal industry? I think that's what you kind of want to hear about with this show. Sure. And the reality was it was COVID uh, that drove me out of education. So I'd been in education for 10 years and had already been in 16 months into the pandemic. And I was getting extremely burned out uh, in education. As you can imagine, budget cuts had already happened for 10 years of my career. And now COVID happened and there's just no money in the education system. You're having to you know pay for supplies to be safe and trying to invest in technology. So now we can do more distance learning, all of those things. So you had budgets that were already bad. Now they're crushed. Um, and, and the other thing was, is you know, there's politics in all organizations, but now education became more political than ever. Uh, at this point, you have people, you know, fighting about: Do we come back in person? Do we still stay distance? Do we require masks? Do we not require masks? And it was just making education not about education. I felt like anymore that all of a sudden we were all lost in this whole world of debate against what the politics were and stop, you know, we really stopped ignore or we were ignoring what is it we need for the students. So I was just really, really burned out. But what happened was, is our owner, Scott and Rich, uh, they've been in the appraisal industry for 30 years and they uh, were big mentors of mine. Scott actually graduated Baker where I was working. And so I had known them for 10 years. Uh, I had a friendship with them and we were just meeting as uh, as friends talking about what we were doing, what I'd built at the school, what they had been working on as projects. And they started telling me about RSDS. And this was very the conceptual age. We were just getting started. And they were talking about how they wanted to do trainees and teach around the appraisal industry and bring them in. And at that moment, I looked at them dead square in the eye. And I said, you're building a university for the appraisal industry. You're lucky to take the education and provide the experiences, bring these things together through mentorship and, and, and learning and really drive something that changes the industry. You know, we do focus on bringing diversity into the industry, but the core purpose is appraisal. So that's what we do. And, I, and the more we talked about this and really started thinking about it, 
it energized me all of a sudden that I could be doing education while not working for a college. I could do education at a different lens. And so that's actually what drove me into RSDS. So one of the questions I get frequently when I talk about your company is, what does RSDS stand for? I'm sure you get that quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, we do. I do get that. Um, so it's funny. What it does stand for, it's our initials of our owners. Uh, but that's not what they uh, ever intended with this business was to have their name on the business. Uh, what, what happened was is RSDS was a business that was on a shelf. It, it was a holding company that they had many, many, many years ago, I think 15, 20 years ago. And so when they started talking about getting going with RSDS, it was like, do we go create this fancy name that is so awesome about appraisals or do we just go build a company, get going? And if this model works, then we'll rebrand that something that fits. So we said, why don't we just use something that was already founded? Let's just get going and let's just see if this is a model that can work. And what happened was is the model exploded, blew up, and all of a sudden everyone knew about RSDS and people were like, have you heard of RSDS? Have you heard what they're doing? And so then we had this crossroads of, well, do we change the name now that everyone knows what it means? Uh, so it, it stands for our owner's initials, but that's not what they would have ever wanted. And that's, I explain it to people, uh, you're making it harder than it needs to be. RSDS, there's no fancy uh, secret acronym there. It's the initials of the owners. So uh, I get questioned frequently on, you know, explain this, explain this company to me, explain their philosophy. Why is it so different than the traditional appraisal model? So why don't you take that? What, what makes RSDS different than the traditional appraisal firm? Yeah, absolutely. So, well, first I'll say like, who are we? And then, yeah, what makes us different? So, one, you know, RSDS was created to really help solve the 30 year problem in the appraisal profession. And that was barrier to entry. Uh, the current system was lacking, uh, had a labor shortage, lacked youth, diversity, inclusion, very few uh, military service members. Uh, but because of that, it created poor service levels. Uh, high fees for homeowners and home buyers to get appraisals done. At one point to get an appraisal done, I think it was over 60 days when the industry was really booming. And, and so the industry started to figure out like, well, how do we fix this problem? And so it was some introduction of technology. Uh, there was the appraisal waiver now being referred to as value acceptance. There was bifurcated products. And really the RSDS solution to this whole problem of uh, poor service, but also a, a labor shortage is why don't we just go hire and train more people to get into the profession? And if we're going to go hire and train them, well, why don't we go try to create high paying careers for deserving people who are blocked out of the system? So that doesn't mean we're not going and recruiting white men to be in the industry, but we are giving an extra emphasis to those that are being blocked out. So we're going to women's colleges, we're going to HBCUs. We're intentionally putting ourselves in the audiences of the people that are not into the system to try to create access and try to create opportunities for those that have not been able to come in. Um, so it, it's not, I, you know, people get on the internet and, and, and all the chats and they're like, you're create, if you do this, you're going to create obstacles where now whites can't get into the industry. And it's like, well, that's still going to always happen. We're always going to provide opportunity. We, we legally cannot block someone out from applying for a job. And we recruit all ages, sex, genders, sexual orientations, everything. Very, you know, very inclusive. But what we do do is spend resources in areas that are blocked out and try to create opportunities for those that may not even know the appraisal industry existed. If you would have asked me five years ago, I wouldn't even know anything about the appraisal industry. Um, and so I've had to educate myself. I came in actually as a trainee because how are you going to build something if you don't know anything about the industry? So I took 200 hours of coursework, did my experience hours, did 500 hours of the experience hours just to even understand what is the industry and what is the process? Because you can't talk about it if you don't know what you're doing. Right. Right. So what are you, what steps are you taking to recruit from some of our uh, areas where we have seen a lack? of appraisers where you said you're going to university. <laughs> How does that recruitment process look? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's two steps to this. There's one, we've got to have an immediate return on initiative. So we're talking about going to career fairs, going and working with juniors, seniors, 
go into uh, college, you know, events to talk about the appraisal industry. And that's recruiting juniors and seniors, you know, that are graduating to come join our company. But the long-term solution for the industry is honestly to start educating about the industry earlier in someone's education. I'm talking seventh grade. People start to wow. know what job they're wanting to go. So we haven't got to that step yet, but I think for this industry to make, you know, very big shifts, we got to teach people what the appraisal industry is and what part does that have to do with the mortgage industry and all of those pieces? How do they come together? We've got to teach people about that. Um, and I think that starts seventh, eighth, ninth grade to really teach them, but we can't do that today. And so how do we get that immediate uh, return is going to college events, you know, investing in things like the appraisal diversity initiative, trying to be present in all the audiences that are possible to, you know, to, that fulfill our mission, fulfill our mission of, you know, bringing those in that have, that have, that have been left out previously. You know, I think that's what also makes us different is there's a lot of people saying they want to bring diversity into the profession. And so they're waving that diversity flag uh, and they're saying, Hey, we, we do this, but I would challenge them on what are their actual results? Are they actually graduating people to become licensed and certified who are female, who are appraisers of color, uh, who are in the military? The majority of RSDS are those demographics today. And and that's not what the appraisal industry is. I mean, there's stats that vary from 70 to 90% of the industry uh, is a white male. And, and so that's, that's okay. That's where we're at today, but that doesn't mean we can't change it. And right. so I, I like to challenge people on, are you just waving the flag or are you actually doing the hard work? Are you engaging with them? Are you recruiting them? Are you providing them opportunity? You know, there's a lot of programs out there that'll provide enough money to get them their trainee license. Well, that's only 75 hours. They still have another 125 hours of education and 1500 hours of experience. You know, our yeah. ES is investing in salaries, commission, the technology, insurance, MLS, e &O, continuing ed, all of those things to get them to graduation and then have a successful business. You know, providing them the clients that actually are gonna give them the work to be a successful appraiser. And by the way, the market's crashed right now. It's the lowest volume that's out there and RSD is succeeding. And I think it's because we're staying true to our mission uh, and, that, and that's client service, that we commit to service five day turn times when the market was due in 60 days, we said, no, we only accept enough work that we could complete in five business days. We also update all of our orders uh, on the status delivery every day. We did 2,300, a little over 2,300 appraisals last month. And I think we had 18 phone calls all month. Oh, what's the status of an order? So less than 1% of our orders ever need a phone call on them. Oh, what's the status? And that's something that we're committed to. And then the third part I would say about this is we are also challenging our partners on how are they committing to the diversity agenda. Um, you know, there's again, there's a lot of people waving the flag that we want to support diversity. But let's say uh, you're a mortgage lender or you're an AMC and you have and you have appraisals. Well, who's on your panel right now? There's not there's not enough appraisals for the number of appraisers. So a lot of people right now are saying we don't need more appraisers on our panel. And I would challenge that to say, well, you just told me you're supporting diversity initiatives. So how are you providing opportunities to these appraisers of color, to these women, to these military service members to not only get licensed, but now to have a successful career? If you continue only letting the older white men on, on the panel, that is what you, it, that's all you're gonna support. And, and so we've got to push the agenda further and understand that we have to provide access and opportunity to those that may not have that today. Right, wow, that's an impressive mission. Your business model is very unique to the appraiser profession. Most appraisers, as you know, are unaffiliated. They work on their own, most of them from home, uh, so they don't get that contact with other appraisers. And, you know, USPAP, our governing document, says appraisers need to be doing what their peers are doing. So it seems that your business model embraces that philosophy that you create your peers, you, you know your peers, and you have people to bounce your ideas off. I think that's crucial, especially with some of your new folks that are coming in. I had the pleasure 
of speaking to your Kansas City group uh, a few weeks ago and seeing that young, diverse group of individuals who were thirsty for knowledge, who wanted to see this profession move forward, who were embracing technology was so refreshing. It was very energizing for me as a 25-year veteran of the industry to see this new blood, that it was there and the energy and the drive and the want to was there. So how do you keep that up with your staff? Yeah, I think there's many things that play into that. But one is we ask our, our, our team to be three things. They have to be kind, they have to be coachable, and they have to be humble. Uh, they have to do those things every day, and not only within themselves, but with those that they're around. But we see RSDS as a community of edu of education and practice. Uh, we are not at the end of our learning. Every day we are learning in RSDS. And so we have channels that are directly within our offices, but also across the country. We even raise questions, ask questions, and how would you handle this situation? And what we find is it's not just the trainees learning, it's people that have been in the industry for 20, 30 years that were working on their own and they didn't have somebody to ask those questions to, and now they do. I, I literally last week saw someone say, I just realized today that I've been doing something wrong for 25 years. <laughs> and that's humbling. That's what we're saying. It's being yeah. humbling to say, I may not always be right. And so let me ask this community how they handle with something and let's continue to grow. You know, RSDS requires all, all staff members to do monthly trainings. So no matter how far you've been in the industry, how long you've been in, there's still trainings that are for trainees and for the licensed and certifieds to continue their development. And there are many, many different topics are covered in those. But again, your learning does not stop. Your learning is endless and it's going to continue evolving as we grow. Um, and, and so we find that integral to everything that we do. I think the other thing is it's the type of person that we bring into the company that really defines our company, our culture. Our culture is it's special. And and I find that our people are full of grit and they're full of stories. I, I have trainees. It's humbling. Um, they'll spend their last dollar to get on a flight for that interview. You know, they have wanted to get in the industry for two years. And so they will do everything they can. They will fly across the country. They will move across the country. They will pack up their stuff and tomorrow be in an office if they got hired. You know, last year we interviewed 3,000 people to be a trainee. And unfortunately, you know, we, we don't have that many opportunities. We only have, you know, last year I think we were able to hire maybe 60, 70 people out of 3,000. And, and so it's those people with the grit and the story but everyone has a story, you know, there's appraisers that are trainers for us. And I, there's one that comes to mind that completely lost their marriage. And so now they're out on their own with their son trying to make a living. And RSDS was that opportunity for them now to reinvent themselves and to provide an income that fulfilled their whole family. And, and they do that. And they're one of the best trainers that we have today. Um, but I could go through every employee, all 120 sure. of them and they're full of stories and grit. And that's what we're looking for. We're not just looking for someone that takes this job for granted, someone that's looking to take this opportunity for granted, but someone that's committed to the journey and willing to go above and beyond no matter what the client needs to fulfill that order. And, and that's because, again, this homeowner, this is their largest purchase of their life. Right. Buying a home is the largest purchase of your life. And so are we giving that order its full attention and care? And we have to, we have to. And that starts with our personalities or who we are as individuals. Sure. Uh, you mentioned the channels. And when I first understood how your company worked, my question was, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners have this question, how do you manage staff on all these in all these different locations? Explain to me how your channels work and how that sort of training work. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of support structures in place throughout our organization. We have what we call client experience directors who really help manage the day in and day out of our appraisers and making sure that orders are being taken care of and they're accepting the orders and uh, making sure all communication is fulfilled. But we also have regional vice presidents who oversee a whole region of appraisers. 
and they're responsible for onboarding appraisers, coaching the appraisers into the RSDS system, and then helping them through their daily operation if there's escalations, those types of concerns. But that coaching doesn't stop just after onboarding. Their coaching is every month. They're sitting down and talking about metrics, the things that are going good. What are the appraisers' challenges? We have different challenges depending on where we are in the country. Uh, we're now in 40 cities, um, and so we've got to manage that. Um, and then you talked about the channels. You know, That's also educating on what do we want in certain channels. So we use a thing called Slack, uh, Slack Communications, and we have many different channels within there. So we have a channel for revisions, another channel for all the mode, uh, all the mode text support. We've got what's in there for the state. So if you're in the state of Florida, here's your community to ask questions. We have them for all licensed and certified. Another one for trainees. We have them within the office on just the trainers for the Arizona Phoenix office. We create many different channels for that education, that conversation, that collaboration to occur. And it occurs all hours of the day. I, there's messages that were coming across at 3 a.m. my time. <laughs> and there was sure. messages going across last night at 11 o'clock when I went to bed. And so that's the thing about it is the learning doesn't stop 8 to 5. The learning is occurring 24-7 because everyone here wants to learn and they want to get better and they want to provide the best appraisal that they can to the client. Well, and you guys take the current model of the supervisor trainee, you know, the one-to-one, -one, yep. and you expand on that so that that trainee is learning from so many more people, not just their one specific supervisor. And to me, as someone who's reviewed and, and looked at appraisals for years, that is one of the flaws in our current system is that you learn how to appraise the way your supervisor does. And you take classes, you learn the basics, but fully understanding that the way your supervisor does it is not the only way. Yeah. And that by exposing your trainees to different thought processes, other trainees' mindsets, other supervisors' mindsets, I think you're creating the more well-rounded appraiser overall. How do you feel about that? Well, I think the the supervisor training model was built for one-man shops. I don't think it was built for appraisal firms. You know, I like the ratio of three to one, but I, I agree with what you're saying that I think there's an opportunity for a trainee to learn from multiple certifieds. And what happens or what the, the issue is, is the state only allows a supervisor to have three people. Right. And so that it limits that collaboration, especially from a business maximizing perspective. But to get the best learning, yes, they need to go learn with so many different appraisers because one may do adjustments different than another person. Uh, one may use technology slightly different than another person. And, and what we really emphasize through our training model is, you know, the requirements to become a certified appraiser is 200 hours of coursework, 1,500 hours of experience. Right. We don't see that 1,500 hours as the limitation or where we got to get to graduate. We see it as the 365 days. And so our graduates are graduating with three to 4,000 experience hours in 365 days because we say... We want you to get the most repetition, the most complexities, the most obstacles, the most difficult home buyers. We want you to deal with the challenges throughout your entire experience. So now when you're licensed on the line, you know how to handle all of that. When you're really limited to just one person in 1,500 hours, you're really limiting on how much you've learned. You're, you're enough to be dangerous, and you're still enough to be dangerous at 3,000 and 4,000 hours. Sure. But what I would love to see is you know, RSDS being able to say, I've got five supervisors, so I can have 15 trainees. And that's still the three to one ratio. Sure. But, it, you know, it's under all of this umbrella. We're not going over the three to one ratio, but we're maximizing the knowledge and the resources that are teaching our, our trainees to be the best version of themselves. I think that's a great philosophy. I think that's a fantastic model. You know, the limitations of the three to one supervisor to trainees that is that is difficult to overcome so 
once your trainees get their experience, say they get their credential, what happens then? Do they stay with your company? What, what, how do you grow after that? Yeah, we do have, uh, we do have a contract in place where our trainees are required to stay with us for three years. And, and the other thing that we do require trainees, and this is determined before they're even hired, is that they have to relocate to another market. Uh, we don't tell them where they have to go. We don't tell people where they're going to move, what market they're going to be in. But we do make sure that our training centers stay a sacred ground and that they can continue to train. There's not an unlimited amount of appraisals that can take place in these markets. And so if uh, they're training in Phoenix, we have X amount of appraisals that we can do each month. And so we can take on this many trainees. Well, once they graduate, they're going to have to go back to either their home market or a new market. And no matter where they go, RSDS still has an obligation to make sure that they've got the geographic competence, they have the ability to be successful in that other area. So that could be achieved many different ways. Ideally, that's linking them up with a local mentor that's an appraiser that can really show them on, you know, 20 different appraisals, 30 different appraisals. Here's how you do it in this market. Here's what these boundaries mean. Here's what these neighborhoods mean. All of those types of things to maximize their learning. It's also meeting with uh, with real estate agents and understanding how they deal with the market. But we see geographic competence as something that you can teach and you can actually teach it through the training model and, and already start educating before they move. You know, so in the last three to six months, it's let's go ahead and start learning on the MLS system there. Let's go ahead and start setting up interviews. Let's start teaching you on your new market. So when you graduate, you're ready to be successful. And you and again, we try to get in local resources that, hey, if you have a problem, call person X and they'll meet you at the appraisal. They'll mm -hmm. help you on this report. But again, it's a community of practice. We, we the, the learning is also reach out to other appraisers. They've moved. How do, how, how do you deal with this? There's a waterway. Well, maybe there's some other appraisers on our panel that work around the waterways and in Florida, for example. So a lot of great, great resources. Everyone wants to make everyone successful here. That's the right. most beautiful place is I see people post uh, appraisal reports. Hey, would someone be willing to review this one for me? It's just It's been a different one. And, and they're willing to stop their day, review the report, meet with them via Zoom, and discuss the things that they see standing out on that report. Sure. Embracing that technology is just huge for that training model and understanding. So you said you have training centers in Kansas City, Kansas Phoenix, City, Phoenix San Diego, and Dallas. San and then Diego and we Dallas. recently uh, opened Orlando. Right now, we only have one trainee in Orlando, but we have a second trainee starting in April. So we're, we're starting to get our Florida market uh, off the ground uh, with the training center there. Wow. So they come, they come, work in the training center till they get their license certification. How then, you said maybe they go back to where they originally were from. What other options does a trainee have at that time? Yeah, really anywhere in the country is is open. We try to work with our clients and get numbers on, on what they can expect in terms of volume and, and really try to make an educated decision on where someone should go. But the reality is, is we continue growing. We need appraisers everywhere across the country. Um, and so we, again, don't tell a train or we don't tell any appraiser where they must be. Uh, we're not getting in, into that, into that business, but we do want to provide them, you know, the, the numbers to be successful um, and sure. they can make an educated decision on where they want to be. Great. So I'm sure that you have handled your, your share of the naysayers. Those that say you're an appraiser factory, you're just cranking out appraisers, you're damaging the profession. Mm -hmm. How do you counter that? Honestly, I just ignore them uh, and I just keep building because uh, I think it's hysterical. I think these are people that have too much time on their hands uh, because they can't get appraisals done. So they're honestly, yeah, I think it's a jealousy. I don't care. And I, I say that humbly. I don't care what they think because the numbers show that the appraisal industry has huge gaps. And the gap is actually not narrowing, it's widening uh, between uh, the age, between the gender, between the race. All of these gaps are not narrowing, they're actually widening. So for someone to say that when you're ignorant, 
to, I think, this industry, you know, it does have a racial bias in this issue. The data has shown there it has issues. Now, does that mean every appraiser is bad? Absolutely not. I think the majority of the appraisers are actually phenomenal people, have been really well educated. Uh, and there's some, you know, there's some bad apples that are out there that are spoiling it. But what I would challenge back to the entire industry is, are we doing everything we can to be the best educated individuals every day moving forward? You know, again, our comfort zone is as good as we push that. And so we've got to be able to continue educating, continue critiquing ourselves, continue asking people, review my reports, uh, because things change. And, and, and let's just be an open community of practice and critiquing and growing. And I think that's me and my education background that comes into this. But I think if people are opening to learning and growing, I think anything is possible. Um, and, and so I think that naysayer goes away. Again, I think most of those people are struggling to get orders today. Well, why? Why are you struggling to get orders if you've been in the industry this long? And I would say it probably comes back to your quality of reports, your your commitment to service, a lot of your practices. I, I say this humbly, RSDS is about 90 to 92 percent utilization right now. We're at what capacity. We have people asking to buy our capacity at the beginning of the year for the whole year because it's like buying the first class flight. You know, not everyone wants to to fly spirit. There's nothing wrong with spirit, but people do want to have better seats. They want to, you know, have that, that, that quality experience. And we want to provide the, that to everyone that we possibly can. And I think it's special. I think it's special that, that people want to work with us, want to grow with us because they see the bigger picture here. It's again, we're not just waving a diversity flag. We're actually doing things. We're trying to grow the profession. We're trying to grow the education and trying to grow the support and resources for appraisers nationwide. Right. And I liked your flight analogy. I also would include in that flight analogy, flying an airline that arrives on time and flights aren't canceled. As a former bank reviewer, uh, that was my biggest frustration with ordering and reviewing appraisals was the communication piece, the timeliness, the meeting deadlines, when at all possible. We always understand things happen in the world and sometimes it's not possible to meet a deadline. But when you were talking about the daily communication with clients, Mm -hmm. I think that is so impressive and so important in our profession. We tend to get labeled a little bit aloof and we we don't we don't want to be bothered give us the assignment you'll get it back when you get it but clients have deadlines as well so how do you instill that um, sense of urgency that sense of obligation in your trainees yeah i mean no appraiser wants to be bugged all day from from a client or what's the status of an order so Instead of being bugged, why don't you just start your day with updating them on the status of the order and, and what the expected delivery is on that, or is the order still on track? Uh, you're, you can only have so many reports in your queue, and for you to update 10 to 15 reports in your queue, we're talking 15 to 20 minutes of your day. So if you made right. the first 15 to 20 minutes of your day about updating the status of the order, guess what? You're not going to get a phone call for the rest of the day on your order because you've already told them what to expect. Again, this goes back to 20, 2,300 appraisals, 18 phone calls, 18 phone calls all month that someone didn't know what the status of the report was for that day. You know, the other thing is you said on-time delivery. Yeah, situations do arise. So let's communicate when those situations arrive and let's make it right. Month over month, we're at 99% on time. There's no reason for a report to be late. I, there is some circumstances that can arise, something that we're still waiting on. Every so often, internet crashes in a city. Um, unfortunately, all the mode or your form building software may crash every so often. Or today, the MLS is down in my city. Uh, some of things are outside your control that drive that 1%. But again, that's a 1%. That's We can deal with the 1%. But you know, people that 50% are on time with their reports, I would say that's personal. Uh, I mean, sure. you should take that personally. You should right. be someone that you're dependable on, someone that you that you would want to be committed to. 
And and so that starts with our trainees. We educate on that. If you're not going to do that, you're not going to work for us. Again, we hire the best people, the people that are packing up their lives, moving across the country, people that have been trying to get in the appraisal industry for two to five years, have called a right. hundred appraisers, have been told, no, I'm not doing that. So we find that people that work for us want to do that because they've been wanting to have this job forever and they would never sacrifice that. Um, but really it comes down to commitment to your client. You've got to be committed to your client. You got to take care of the people in your life that take care of you. And if you do that, we can all be successful together. Right. I used to tell appraisers that I worked with, I don't want to contact you. I don't want to call you or email you. But when the due date comes and goes and I have heard nothing from you, that's when I do have to reach out to you. I have my deadlines to meet as well, as well as the loan officer has their deadlines to meet. So I I love that practice of keeping the client in the loop regularly and being proactive instead of reactive in that situation. I think that is a philosophy that appraisers around the country would embrace and should embrace contacting your client more often as opposed to hoping they leave you alone and then you send the report in. Agreed, 100%. All right. Well, anything you want to share with us in closing, Dr. Randy? You know, I just, I'm I'm thankful for the people that continue to support the company and support the initiatives. And and that's, that's my clients. That's the appraisers. That's the trainees. That's the state regulation boards. That's you, Julie, everyone that continues to say, you know what, we can do better and we can continue growing together. People that don't just want to wave the flag, but truly want to wake up each day and say, let's get better as a profession. To those people, I say thank you. I, I, I just, RSD is just fully committed to this. We're not slowing down and, and slowing down, meaning we're not going to stop bringing people into this industry. We're going to provide those opportunity to those that have been left out and we're going to continue providing great opportunity to appraisers that have been in this industry for 30 years. We want to fully support it and we want to grow with those that want to grow. That is fantastic and very refreshing. So I thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Randy, and looking forward to big things from RSDS, continued big things. So, Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. And that's Beyond the Numbers with the McKissick Appraisal. I'm your host, Julie Molendorf, and thanks for spending the day with us. Today.